So in screencast number two, what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at the different types of cells that you would find in the body of a sponge. Now, as we do that, we're going to discover that these cells that we're going to discuss are going to be loosely arranged in what we call a gelatinous matrix. And we're going to call that matrix either mesohyl or mesenchyme. Now over here on the right hand side, you can see this mesohyl or mesochyme represented by this yellow layer that you see right here. And you're going to notice all these different types of cells are going to be embedded within this layer. Now the first cell we're going to look at is one called coanocytes. Now we've already talked about this cell in a previous screencast. Now remember the coanocyte was basically a cell that looks somewhat like this. It's going to have a collar and that collar is going to have what we call microvilli. Now in the middle of that microvilli we're going to have a central flagellum. Now the purpose of the flagellum is to pull water into the sponge. Now as that water is pulled in that microvilli which make up the collar is going to act as a sieve and that sieve is going to collect food. Now once that food is collected that food is going to be passed down as we would mentioned in the screencast before to an archaeocyte. Now that archaeocyte is going to be a, an amoeboid type of cell which means it can actually move from place to place within the sponge. Now once that food reaches the archaeocyte it's going to be digested and in this case it's going to perform what we call intracellular digestion which means digestion within the cell. Now in addition to feeding we also need to understand that the quanocytes can also at times participate in sexual reproduction and we're going to talk about reproduction a little bit later on in the screencast. Now the next type of cell we're going to look at is one called an archaeocyte. Now, as we had said in the slide before, archaeocytes are considered amoeboid cells, which means they can move about within the mesohyl or the mesenchyme of the um, sponge. Now, these archaeocytes are going to participate in digestion. That's going to be one of their functions, which means they're going to have the ability to phagocytize particles that are brought in by the quanocytes. Now, what's really unique about the archaeocytes is they have an amazing ability to differentiate into many other types of cells found within the sponge. Um, one of those would be one called sclerocytes, and these are going to be the types of cells that will produce the spicules in some sponges. So over here you can notice the sclerocyte is represented right down here, and you can see the spicule that's being produced by this sclerocyte. Now there's also um, special archaeocytes that are called spongicytes, and their job is to secrete spongin. Um, we also have a couple that are called cholinocytes and lophocytes. Now both of these types of cells will be there to produce collagen, and you can see these um, up towards the top of our screen. So again, these archaeocytes are pretty amazing. Not only can they um, participate in digestion, but they can also differentiate or change into lots of different other types of cells within the sponge. So the next type of cell we're going to look at is one called a panacocyte. Now the panacocyte is going to be a group of cells that comes closest to representing true tissue within the sponge. Now they're going to be incorporated within what we call the panacoderm of the cell. Now remember the panacoderm is very similar to um, what we would consider skin in the organism. Now this panacoderm is going to be found both on the exterior and interior surfaces of the sponge. Now what's really interesting about the panacocytes is that some of these um, panacocytes might participate in phagocytosis, so they actually might have a role in feeding for some sponges. Now some can actually be contractile, which means they have the ability to contract, and they could regulate the surface area of the sponge. Now if you think back to screencast number one we had talked about three different body designs and we had said that the more surface area that you have on the sponge the larger the sponge could be. So this could be an advantage to the sponge, this contractile nature of the panacocyte. Now some are going to be modified into contractile myocytes which means they're going to be changed into a different type of cell. Now they're still contractile in nature but they're going to find themselves very close to the oscula, which is going to be that large opening towards the top, or they could be found um, next to the dermal ostea, which are going to be the small pores that you'll find in the sponge. And they're going to be there to regulate the amount of water flow both into and out of the sponge. So again, as the water moves in, those um, myocytes would work either to squeeze or close off or to open up those openings to allow more water in or maybe less water in.
and the, the osculi that you would find towards the top of the sponge, they would act to either contract, close up, or maybe to open up that large oscula. So in other words, releasing more water or maybe keeping more water in. So one really unique thing about sponges is they have a tremendous ability to regenerate. Now to regenerate something means to make something new. So if you have a sponge that has an injury of some sort or maybe has lost a body part, these animals can actually repair or restore that lost body part. Now in addition to regeneration, they also participate in something called somatic embryogenesis. Now what this means is you might have some sponges that become so damaged that they're going to disassociate. Now when they disassociate it means they're going to break up into small fragments, so small groups of cells. Now these small aggregates are going to have the ability to develop into an entirely new sponge. And so remember we have all these different types of cells that you're going to find within the sponge, but if this should happen each of those cells may have a specific job before they disassociated, but now they can actually completely reorganize, which means some of those cells might actually change into another type of cell, so they can actually function as a group. So again, this is going to be considered a form of asexual reproduction because we have a, a sponge that was completely, totally associated or totally put together, has disassociated, broke apart, and now we have lots of new sponges being produced as a result. So another form of asexual reproduction would be the production of buds. And when you talk about sponges, they can produce either external buds, which would be buds on the outside, or they can produce internal buds, which are buds on the inside of the sponge. So over here on the right-hand side, you can notice um, we have an example of a sponge that's producing an external bud. So it's going to be kind of similar to the budding that took place in some of the protozoans that we talked about in chapter 11. So these buds are going to become detached, which means they're going to break apart from the parent sponge. And as they float away, as they establish themselves someplace else in the environment, they're going to have the ability to develop into a brand new sponge. So that's considered asexual reproduction. So we don't have the participation of gametes in this case. Now, as I had said before, in addition to external bud formation, we're also going to have internal bud formation. Now, we're going to call these internal buds gemules. Now, these gemules are very similar to the cysts that we had talked about again back in chapter 11 with some of the protozoans. So the archaeocytes are going to collect, and again, in the mesoheal or mesochyme of the sponge, and they're going to become surrounded by a tough spongin coat that's going to be embedded with silica spicules. So silica spicules are going to make up this gemule. Now the main purpose of these gemules is that when you have a sponge that dies because of some type of um, situation in the environment, maybe a, a, an increase or a decrease in temperature, maybe the water quality isn't as good as it used to be, these gemules can actually survive and what they do is they remain dormant and they're going to help to basically protect the sponge from any type of harsh environmental conditions. And once the conditions in the environment become more favorable, then just like a cyst, these gemules are going to break open and they're going to form a brand new sponge. So in addition to asexual reproduction, we also need to understand there are some sponge species that will participate in sexual reproduction. Now remember, sexual reproduction is the production of gametes. So we're talking about the production of sperm and we're talking about the production of eggs. Now there's going to be some terms that we're going to use in this particular um, screencast that we're actually going to use repeatedly throughout the year. And this first term is monoecious. If you have an organism that is considered monoecious, that means we have one individual that is going to have both male and female sex cells, which means it's going to produce both sperm and egg. Now in the case of the sponge, we're going to have the choanocytes, which are going to transform or change into the sperm during sexual reproduction. If you think back to the beginning of our screencast, when we mentioned choanocytes, we had said that some choanocytes will participate in sexual reproduction for some sponges. Now, these sperm are going to be taken in by another sponge, and once they're taken in, they're going to be phagocytized by the choanocytes found in that sponge, which means, again, kind of similar to food particles, they're going to be taken in by those choanocytes. Then they're going to be carried to the oocytes. And what we're talking about here is we're simply talking about the egg cells that are found within that sponge. Now, some sponges are going to be considered viviparous, and what we mean by viviparous is that once the um, egg cell has been fertilized, we now have something called a zygote, which is simply, again, a fertilized egg, 
and this egg is going to be retained or um, kept in the sponge itself and while it's inside of the sponge it's going to derive nourishment from the sponge. All right. Now sometimes we'll have eggs and sperm that are actually released into the environment and so fertilization is going to take place outside of the sponge. Now in this case we're talking about a condition that's called oviparous. Now again oviparous means both the egg cell and the sperm are released and fertilization occurs on the outside. So as that egg develops it's going to hatch and whether or not it's viviparous which means it's retained within and hatches within the sponge or it's released and actually hatches outside the sponge, it's going to produce a free swimming ciliated larvae. And that larvae is going to be called a parenchymula. And over here on the left hand side, you can see an example of this larvae. And as we had said before, it's going to be ciliated. Now, the cilia is important because it's going to allow that um, larvae to basically um, transport itself within the environment. And so once it has reached a certain stage, it's going to lose the cilia, it's going to settle down, it's going to become sessile, and it's going to establish itself someplace new in the environment. All right, so that's going to finish up our um, second screencast for Chapter 12. In fact, it's going to be our last screencast for Chapter 12. Now, one thing that was not mentioned in this screencast was the different classes of sponges that are mentioned in your textbook. You will look at these in lab. Um, it is important that you do make sure that you are familiar with these um, before we take the summative assessment on Chapter 12. And again, as always, please make sure that you have completed the um, study guide that goes along with this screencast before coming to class.